Got a couple more things I'm thankful for. One of them is, for all intents and purposes, the election season is over. Hallelujah. Are we thankful? Um, I voted for the first time in Arizona, and I have to say, as I drove back to work, it felt good. It felt good because I feel like I let my voice be heard. For me, participating in the election is like the same thing as being a Minnesota Vikings fan. Um, you don't win everything that you want, but you can put a few victories together here and there. So it, it, it felt good to have my voice be heard on Tuesday. And I was driving back to the office. I thought about how cool it is that Veterans Day comes just a few days after we vote. And as I was driving back, then I started thinking about my hero, my Grandpa Larson, who was a World War II veteran. He served in the 8th Armored Division in Europe. And I get to live in a democracy where my voice gets to help pick who our leaders are. Um, and it's because of people like him who was ready when their country called on him. What's that true statement? Freedom isn't free. Or how about the other one that says all gave some, some gave all. And so I didn't want you guys to get buried in all the previous things because I wanted this to be very special. If, if you're a veteran in here today, would you please stand so we can honor you and say thank you? Thank you, guys. Thank you. We cannot take all the freedoms that we have been provided for granted. So, veterans, we thank you so much for what you did. One thing I noticed about the election was that in Alabama, the people passed a proposition to allow the Ten Commandments to be posted or placed on government buildings and courthouses and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. That felt like a win, right? And then I started thinking to myself, you know what would be even cooler? If we, the body of Christ, could get the Ten Commandments written on our hearts. That would be truly world-changing, right? Let's take a look and see what we've covered so far in our series. The first four commandments all deal with how we're supposed to relate with God. It's the first part of the law of love. Love God with all that you have. And this is what God is specifically asking for. He says, I want to be your one and only. I want to have something special with you. Number two is don't worship any created thing ahead of me. Keep your priorities straight. There's no life there. I have nothing but life for you. He says, do not take my name in vain, which is actually one of my favorites because what he's saying there is don't treat me like I don't exist. Don't treat me like I'm powerless here and I don't see everything. Number four, God says, build the rhythm of your life around me by setting aside one day every week to refocus your life on me and to enjoy holy rest. And I hope that you're taking commandment number four very seriously because it's for you and it's good. The next six commandments all deal with how we as human beings can love each other. It's the second part of the law of love where Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. These last six commands are essential if we want to have a healthy society and a holy church. And, and there's incredible grace when I look at this list. Number five, God says, honor your father and your mother. Starts with them. If you're going to love your neighbor, you can't murder them, right? Last week we talked about do not commit adultery. Now coming up, we've got do not steal, do not give false testimony, and do not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And what's amazing to me, you guys, is when we cover number 10, we're going to have a pastor from paradise most likely down here to talk about not coveting other and be thankful for what you have. And we're going to be hearing from a guy who, who lost everything and so did his neighbors. So I just think that's going to be a very special Sunday. We are through the first seven commandments. Today we're taking on commandment number eight. Thou shall not steal. Now I've been studying these commandments all fall and I've been keeping notes and thoughts on them. And when I looked at number eight, thou shall not steal, I honestly thought, what in the world am I going to talk about with this one? I mean, number eight looks like kindergarten. It's so basic. Maybe I should just read commandment number eight ten times, and then we pray, and hopefully we got it, right? Commandment number eight clearly says, do not take anything that doesn't belong to you. If it doesn't belong to you, you should not possess it, right? 
But as I looked at commandment number eight, I realized commandments six through ten all deal with stealing of some kind. Do not murder. Don't steal or take someone's life. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal or take someone else's wife or husband. Do not give false testimony. Do not take away someone's good name. And then when we get to number 10, the word covet. Covet in number 10 is what's going on in our heart that causes us to break all the nine that came before. I was thinking about this this morning. It was this covet in our heart that led Adam and Eve to try to try to be God. They coveted God's position and they tried to steal it and look what they brought us so let's focus on commandment number eight thou shall not steal aka do not take what doesn't belong to you now i've never been robbed and i'm grateful for that for most of my adult life i really haven't had much stuff that's worth stealing anyway but I know a lot of people who've been robbed, and when I talk to these people, a certain theme comes up over and over and over again. It wasn't the hassle of trying to get all of their stuff replaced. It's the fact that they felt personally violated. Their sacred space was invaded. Someone broke their boundaries, came into their cars or their houses or their business, and took what didn't belong to them. Being robbed, having someone break into your house and go through your stuff, or having someone smash the window of your car can make you feel dehumanized. Anytime someone takes something of ours without permission, it's normal to feel dehumanized. The word dehumanized means that you're treated like you're not valuable. And therefore, because you're not valuable, it's no big deal if I take things from you. Your feelings, your safety, your boundaries, your personhood are not important. Someone who's stealing from someone views that person as less than human. All that really matters to them is that they can get what they want. You don't matter. Thou shall not steal seems like a kindergarten level command, but it can tear apart marriages, families, businesses. It can tear apart churches, and it threatens society itself. Stealing happens more than we realize. A while back I met with someone who was divorced for biblical reasons her husband had cheated on her but after the, the divorce it, it, it turned out that he had been stealing from her parents business for years and so insult to injury he had been stealing from her parents for years have you ever seen this situation where the patriarch of, of, a, of a big family passes away and then next thing you know the surviving siblings are going to court because one of the kids stole the inheritance and spend it on themselves. Have you heard of that sad story? This kind of stuff tears families to shreds. It would break the heart of the patriarch who died if he knew what was happening to his family now that he, or, or the matriarch, they're gone. It's a heartbreaking mess. I worked in a country club in Sioux Falls, South Dakota for 10 years as a tennis coach. The head tennis pro was a brilliant player, but he was a sloppy administrator and a pretty inept businessmen and he was always in trouble with the business ladies in the office and I had I hated being sent down to the business office for any reason because they always gave me the business about my tennis boss just a few years ago it came out that one of those business office ladies had been skimming off the top and over the course of over a decade had taken eight hundred thousand dollars and a lot of the money she stole was the tips that the single mother waitresses were earning by working a second job at the country club restaurants. So this lady was stealing from single mothers and from the tennis pro who couldn't keep track of his books very well. He didn't even know how he was being robbed. And this lady's actions affected a whole community. How can a husband steal from his hardworking in-laws? How can a brother steal the inheritance from his own brothers and sisters? How can someone steal tip money from single moms that are killing themselves to provide for their children. In order to justify our greed, we have to dehumanize the people we're stealing from. And we may be guilty of this more than we realize. There are situations where we say, well, who cares? It's not a big deal. I don't feel bad about this because that person's a total jerk. Or we say, I don't feel bad about keeping this because I'm not giving it to the government. I think most of us would agree that it's very wrong to steal, but it's possible that we make compromises here and there that make us guilty of breaking this command. Some simple forms 
of stealing, or maybe I should say common forms of stealing. The first issue is paying our income taxes. I have no problem at all with anyone trying to lower their tax burden legally. I have no problem with that. But cheating, lying, or admitting, omitting certain details to illegally lower your taxes, that's stealing. Jesus, when confronted by the religious leaders about paying taxes, said plainly, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar's. And now we think we've got it bad paying taxes today in our current state in the political world. We've got it made in the shade comparing, compared to the Jewish people under Roman rule. We may disagree with our government, but in Jesus' day, if you disagreed with the government, you could be crucified for, for having a voice in that matter. There was no justice for you if you were a Jew. Can you imagine paying taxes and knowing that your money, that your hard-earned money, was paying the salary of the soldier who was leading your sons or daughters or your brothers or sisters off to be crucified. Do you know how hard it would be to pay those salaries knowing that? Even under those conditions, Jesus said, pay your taxes. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Another area where people often steal, thinking it's no big deal, is lying on expense reports at work. Maybe you claim some type of personal trip as a business expense, or you turn in your mileage for work, but you exaggerate the number of miles you drove. You round up by 5, 10, 15, 20. Another example, maybe you take work supplies home with you. I know there are times where my favorite pens that I bought for work follow me home and end up in our pen jar. And maybe it's easy to say, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a stupid pen. But remember the heart of this command. It is not okay to take something that doesn't belong to you. Now these are common, simple areas in which normally really good people are sometimes tempted to stumble and fall. And then we get to some deeper, more complex issues. If you're taking advantage of someone in business, um, if you're not being fair, if you're building your business on the back of someone else and not fairly compensating them for it, you could be guilty of breaking this commandment. For those of you who are business owners, how are you doing making sure you're running a Christian business? Do you have a godly vision for your company, or is it all about building an empire and cashing out all the rewards? In one of the best books ever written, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, we meet a very noble hero. Many of you have heard of him. His name is Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean went to prison for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving family. After 20 plus years of hard labor and some pretty amazing providential turns of events, remember the bishop who forgave him for stealing? What you might not realize is that after that, Jean Valjean becomes the mayor of a town and he owns almost all the businesses, businesses in the town and he sees his business as a way to bring hope to an entire city. He isn't in it for the money. He's in it to help people who are just like he once was, desperate and starving. And so for Jean Valjean, the people mattered more than his profits. So Christian businessmen and businesswomen, others in places of leadership influence, is there a bigger vision for your business than just the bottom line? Now you might be sitting out here this morning thinking, well, Matt, I got number eight. I don't steal. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't take work supplies home with me. I don't claim personal expenses as business expenses. I, p I pay my employees a fair wage. I don't think I break commandment number eight. And you know what? There's a pretty good chance some of us are going to get on the scoreboard with a win today. I'm hoping so. I really am. But before we get too cocky, there's one more test I want to run us through. And it's what God is saying in Malachi 3, verses 8 through 12. Look at this conversation. God's the speaker. He says, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. And you ask, How are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. 
I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. What an amazing scripture. How can a mere mortal rob God Almighty? I mean, seriously. He is his own security system. He sees all things. You can't sneak up on him. He's all-powerful, so you can't strong-arm him and tie him up so you can steal from him. God accuses his people of stealing from him, and the people are like, God, that's impossible. How in the world have we robbed you? And God says, in the area of your giving, in your tithes and offerings, you and your whole nation are under a curse, he says, because you're robbing me. Isn't this fascinating? God is so generous to us, even to the point of sacrificing his sin or his son to pay for our sins. And he promises us to always provide for us. He says, don't worry, I've got you. There's nothing for you to be afraid of. There's no reason to be afraid. And on top of all of that, we're allowed to keep 90% of what we earn to provide for our families. He just asked for 10% of what he has given for the, for the maintenance and the ministry of his church. He wants us to set aside a tie, the 10%, to be invested in the kingdom because we know we're not here that long. And yet how many, despite all of that, what God has done for us, how many of us are still robbing God? Now I know here, here we're talking about it, and some people are going to get so upset because we talk about money. Maybe not this church, but that's normal. I think around the country is people don't want to hear this. But it's interesting, people who are tithing and who understand the beauty of it and are walking out in that obedience, they love this conversation. They wish we talked about it every month because their giving is such an exciting thing. They love hearing about it. This is the ultimate heart issue. My very first church, first job I was a youth pastor. I was only a four-year-old Christian. I was in seminary. I'm 22 years old. I'm newly married. I'm trying to figure out life. And I was giving $50 a month to the church, and I thought I was a hero. I had never before heard a sermon on tithing, not in my entire life. I didn't know that whole concept existed. And when we heard a sermon on that topic, boy, did Libby and I have a serious talk. And I wish I was the one who took the lead. I wish I could tell you that I was the one who said, Libby, we got to step out in faith and be obedient to God. This is the one time where God says, test me in this. I think we should try it. God says, try me in this and see if I don't bless you. I wish that was what was coming out of my mouth after we first learned about tithing. But I was dragging my feet, and Libby, being the godly woman that she was, was pushing us to do it. And you know what happened once we started? It was exhilarating. It was fun to see that everything that was just read in that scripture came true. But about five or six years later, there was a season <clears throat> where I was working at a different church. We were getting ready to leave because I was struggling there bad. And so in my righteous indignation, Libby and I quit tithing. And the moment we made that decision, it was like seven big holes appeared in our life raft okay, in our life. I had to start teaching more tennis lessons on top of my full-time job. Libby was working two jobs, and we even started renting out our basement to two college-age kids so that we could have extra income. And what was amazing, even though we were working more than ever, we were collecting more than ever, we could never cover our costs. And it was mind-blowing. We didn't know how that was possible considering all the work we were doing. And so we moved to paradise. We had a fresh start. We recommitted to tithing from day one, and we realized something amazing. All of a sudden, we were able to survive on my one income. We had the twins. We had four kids under four, and somehow we had all of our needs provided um, on one income. I, I didn't teach tennis again. Libby could stay home. We didn't have our, half of our house filled up with renters. So this is just my testimony. The way I see it now, I can't afford to not tithe. Okay, and I enjoy doing it. I do it online. As soon as it comes up to that, to that pay period, it's gone. I don't let myself hold on to it very long because I don't want to think twice. 
because that's obedience. By the way, when anytime you're doing the right thing and you don't have to have a huge wrestling match in your heart over it, that means you've matured in that area. When you do the right thing without even having to wrestle over it, it's just what you do, then you know you've reached maturity. I think people don't tithe for one reason, and that is their hearts aren't wholly surrendered. We're called to be generous, and we fail to do even the basic scriptural minimum. Our struggles in tithing reveal that we're still tied to this world. When it's a struggle, it means we're still tied to this world. Well, how am I going to? I don't know. That's, that's just, I'm glad I started tithing when we were real poor because that check was easier to write, right? But when you rest, how am I going to? You're basically saying, I don't believe you. Our struggles in tithing reveal that we're still tied to the world. Jesus says, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. And yet our finances are the one area that we refuse to hand over to God. Remember, when we steal or rob from someone, we dehumanize them so that we can justify the evil that we're doing. A lot of people justify not tithing because they want to dehumanize the church. I'm not giving that church my money. Those moronic pastors will spend it on frivolous things like Bibles for the children's ministry. I mean, now there's crazy churches out there that are terrible, and they're going to be judged harshly for what they're doing with God's money because it's all God's. But if that's the way you're feeling about your pastors and leadership, if you're feeling like, I can't give there, I want to ask you two things. Number one, make sure they really are terrible people that can't be trusted. I've seen some amazing godly pastors being judged incredibly harshly, and I don't think the people who were judging them were seeing things clearly or they didn't have a full picture. And number two, if you don't trust your leaders, then why are you going to that church? Because that's, that's an even bigger issue. Now, you may not like what we've just talked about, but we are a full Bible church, okay? We talk about everything in here, even the tough stuff, because we want to be like him. You can't talk about stealing and not talk about this. Thou shall not steal. Do not take what doesn't belong to you. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And even more so, give to the Lord what is the Lord's. There's something this morning that the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear. Please don't ignore that, whatever it is. Before we sing, understand it's not about the money. It isn't. That's not what I'm up here talking about because it's about our hearts. That's what really matters. We're called to give more than just our tithes. We're called to give our time. We're called to use the talents that God has given us for His glory, not our own. There might be more than one way to rob God. What about the time He's given you? Is there room on your calendar for serving? Is there room on your calendar for, for daily time with Him? What about the talents you have? Are you being a good steward of the gifts and passion that God has given you? Or are you using your gifts and your talents only for yourself? Our closing song uh, this morning is an opportunity for, for us to lay everything down. It's a chance to recommit. It's a chance to cut ties that we've made to this world for our sense of security. And it's a chance for us to go all in. So let's pray. I'll have the worship team come up.